my name is Stephen Cusack. I'm from EMBL in Grenoble. And uh, EMBL as a whole, or rather the EMBL Instruct Center, which covers Grenoble, Heidelberg, and, and Hamburg, uh, is hosting this eighth webinar in the series of Structure Meets Function. So I'm going to start with um, a short introduction for those who do not know much about Instruct and then a bit about EMBL Instruct Center. So Instruct is the European research infrastructure for integrated structural biology. And um, it operates a number of programs, the most important of which is access to high-end uh, structural biology research facilities in a number of its centers throughout Europe. And I'll come back to where those are in a minute. But um, it doesn't do just that. It also does a lot of training courses and workshops in topics related to integrated structural biology, that is uh, state-of-the-art techniques, in particular use of multiple interdisciplinary techniques it has a program of internships whereby you can spend, apply to spend a longer time at one of the research centers to get more training, um, as well as doing your, using the facilities in one of the centers. And it has a, a program for research and development funding to, um, to fund new developments in technologies, for instance. There's a fifth activity which isn't written there, but is actually quite important, and that is instructor Eric has a role in coordinating structural biology activities throughout Europe, um, particularly in relation to other S3 infrastructures and uh, the European Commission and things like the European Open Science Cloud. So um, at the moment, there are member states. They're noted here, including one international organization, EMBL, which joined uh, only in 2019. And um, within these member states, there are 11 so-called instruct centers, which are the places you can apply to visit to do advanced uh, structural biology, um, use the facilities. And so uh, these are distributed throughout Europe. Some of them are have a wide range of technologies available, others are more specialized. And um, the, the method of application is via the, the Instruct Eric website. So I'm going to mention a bit about EMBL because we're the host of this organization and we're fairly new uh, into the Instruct Eric organization as it now is. Um, so EMBL is well known for its structural biology, which is uh, activity spread across four sites from Heidelberg, Hamburg, Grenoble, as well as the EMBL EBI, which as you know, is the data repository for, for instance, um, uh, PDBs, structures, cryo -EM structures, SACS data. And so it's the end point of many of the activities that Instruct does. And uh, at the other sites, EMBL is, has sensitive facilities for cryo-EM, X-ray um, scattering, crystallography, sample preparation, crystallization, and so on. For instance, at Hamburg, there's access to the sample characterizing preparation facility, which is rich in different biophysical techniques. And one can directly link that to uh, measurements on beam lines for crystallography or SACS. Um, at Heidelberg, they more specialize in cryo microscopy with several cryos microscopes available for uh, single particle or cryotomography. And uh, this is an activity which is going to become even more important in the new imaging center in Heidelberg, which will open in the summer this year, the service should, should begin in the summer. And this is a, um, a new building with a new concept, which is to bring together the, basically what goes on at the interface between Instruct and Eurobio, Eurobioimaging, that is uh, 
from electron microscopy up towards light microscopy and uh, organismal imaging. So this will center will be available from the summer and um, some of the offer is related to instruct the electron microscopy. In Grenoble, we have a major high throughput crystallization facility, which is linked to uh, directly to data collection on beam lines at the SRF. Um, and that's available through it in Struct. Uh, in particular, we've developed a lot of pipelines that enable this to be done really efficiently. And Hosan will be talking about that in the third talk today. So just another point about EMBL. It, of course, all its service activities have been put to the task of helping COVID-19 research. And this ranges from the COVID-19 data portal that the EMBL EBI established and hosts with a number of other partners and in collaboration with the European Commission. So this receives data, all kinds of data, sequencing data, protein structure data uh, related to SARS-CoV-2 and is available um, uh, to everybody at the address given there. Uh, the MBL, of course, also does collaborative research with, with um, participants in member states, for instance, on, uh, on examining how SARS-CoV-2 behaves in the gut and, and affects pro-inflammatory programs. And of course, it does structural biology. It's, uh, all the facilities are now available, often by remote access, for structural biology research related to COVID-19. And here are some examples of EMBL related SARS CoV 2 related research. Um, and you'll be hearing about uh, one of these from the first speaker on the uh, cryotomography in situ studies on SARS CoV 2 spike protein. But there are a lot of other things going on at different levels of uh, scales of um, study. So, with that uh, introduction, I will first um, highlight the next webinar meeting, which will be by Instruct Center Finland on the 30th of April. So please take a note of that. Sarah Butcher will be moderating that meeting. But right now, today's program consists of three talks. Each will be of 15 minutes, followed by five minutes or more questions if there are more. Um, I should remind you that to ask questions, you need to type into the Q and A uh, facility in Zoom, and I will then relate the questions to the speakers at, at the end of their talk. So the first um, speaker is um, Beata Turanov, who was trained as a computer scientist in Czech, the Czech Republic and then Germany uh, with a focus on visual computing. And after finishing her PhD, she joined EMBL as a postdoc in first in the group of John Briggs and then Martin Beck's lab. And she's been working on uh, techniques and computing aspects of cryotomography. She's now at the molecular sociology, which is a really nice name um, department at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysics in Frankfurt. So I look forward to hearing from Beata uh, on her talk on in situ structural analysis of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein using subthermochrome averaging and molecular dynamics. So over to you, Beata. Thank you for the nice introduction. So at the time we started the project, there was already uh structure of the spy protein was known uh, from single particle but there was very little to known actually uh, to very little known actually about the wall variants and um you know you can see that there is way more into it so there are other proteins there are envelope protein um membrane protein and nucleocapsid proteins so that was all not at all studied at the time we started and um cryo electron tomography was perfect for it because unlike the really high resolution um approaches, it can also offer some uh, insights into the context of, um, of the protein. So that's why we chosen to do this. 
And when I talk about the cryo-electron tomography, for me, this consists always from the whole workflow, from the sample prep all the way to the tomogram analysis. And in our case, the sample preparation was done by Christoph Schurman from Paul Ehrlich Institute in Germany. We got a sample from patient Isole that went over five passages in a Vero E6 cells uh, that led actually to inactivated furin cleavage site. And on top of that, we still fix the sample with 4% paraformaldehyde. And after that, uh, Sonia Welsh uh, processed uh, the sample for cryo-EP. And we can uh, proceed with the image acquisition. And this was done at EMBL in Heidelberg uh, by Wim Hagen. And because it was during the hard lockdown, we actually managed to get three sessions that resulted in total uh, in 11 days on a microscope and Wim screened over four grids. Now, when we saw the data for the first time, we realized that actually uh, the sample is rather sparse on the variants. Um, and you know, one way would be to actually go back to the bench and try to optimize the sample to get a bit more, a uh, bit more particles in it. However, given the hard working conditions back then, uh, we decided to rather maximize the output on the microscope, uh, microscope side. But that never means to actually acquire more data of lower quality. So both me and Vim are big fans of a quality over quantity approach. We prefer to have less data, but keep the quality as high as possible. So what Vim did was actually he spent a lot of time to fish for the right positions to acquire the data. And here I would really like to highlight one nice uh, possibility that one has at the MBL, namely already during the grid mapping, you can start picking your positions because you can open um, your navigator files already in the on the instance on the dummy instance of CDLEM on the support PC that is next to the microscope. So you can really start uh, fishing for the best position possible. And this is the screenshot of all the squares that Vim picked uh, from one grid. These are marked blue. And then the red positions are the ones that were preliminary picked for acquisition. Then he really, for each square he chosen, he went hole by hole to find the clusters of the viruses. And if we zoom a bit more, we can see that this was not an easy task because if you consider that the field of view is as small as this, then on average you would get one particle per, uh, per tilt series, which was not good enough. So Wim spent really hours doing this and finding positions more like this, where we can see three or more uh, viruses. And in the end, he managed to find over 300 positions. So we collected around 300 tilt series with uh, four variants per tilt series on average, which I think was very good. And then once we had uh, them, he acquired the data with the standard, um, oh, now I can see, and I, I can already say a standard uh, settings uh, for the viruses for us. I will not go into the details. What I would like to highlight here is actually the time because at the end of the session, the last session, we actually managed to collect one tilt series in as few as 14 minutes without compromising the quality of the data and without using anything else that is not that is uh, not coming directly from serial EM tilt controller. And I uh, found that very impressive. So here is the look how it actually looked like. So these are one of our tilt series. You can see the viruses are there. We have three variants here. And uh, you can also see the spikes there, which is very nice. Um, in the end, uh, I've chosen 266 tomograms to reconstruct. Um, and um, we uh, harvested almost 101, uh, uh, 1,100 uh, variants. So with that, you can go for tomogram analysis. And now I'll show you how nice the tomograms really are from this data. Uh, we can slice through them and we can nicely see really, really nice details there. And if we hold still for a while, you can see that the double leaf membrane is very well resolved. You can even see the bumps that we believe is M-protein, the highly dense uh, inside of the variants packed with N-protein. And obviously what we can also see are the spikes. And we were interested mo mostly in the spikes. So we started with the analysis of them. And uh, at the first look or first analysis gave that there we had around 40 S proteins per variant. Um, they do not follow any pattern, so they are completely randomly distributed. Then when we looked into the data, into the shape, we could also say that most of them is actually in a prefusion state. That was uh, the confirmation or the structure of this was already known back then. 
so we could say that. Also, post fusion was known, so we know that we don't have that many particles, uh, that many spikes in post fusion state. But the most striking and completely striking and more, more completely new thing was actually that the spikes are flexible. So all the images, when they are really straight coming out of the of the variants that are always presented, are not really uh, very truthful to reality because, as you can see, they really bend. You can see the hinges, and you can see that. They really are straight, and you can even see some unfolding here. So that was as much as we could actually get while looking only on tomogram level. In order to get a bit better insight into the structure, we of course had to go for a so-called subtomogram averaging. Basically, we had to take all the spikes we had in our data, align them on top of each other, and average them to get a better signal and to get a better resolution. And when we did that, we actually obtained the head, so the globular domain of the spike at a sub nanometer resolution around eight angstroms. You can see nicely in the map the helices that are there. This is the top view. Again, again the helices are nicely separated and visible. And we, can, we are even able to fit the models uh, based on the single particle structures into our, uh, into our map. And everything fitted very nicely, including some glycans here. Um, this was still done without using the fact that actually the um, head is uh, symmetric, so it's a trimer. When we impose this symmetry for uh, and use this in our processing, we actually push the resolution even higher and could uh, get to around five angstroms. You can see the helices and you can even see at a certain cases the loops nicely resolved here. And uh, this actually shows us that our data is of a very high quality because we can go as high with the resolution. but all that was to a certain degree already known, although it was nice to have it confirmed from the tomography. What we were really interested in was the lag, and that starts somewhere here. So this was actually the structure that we wanted, we were aiming at. However, when looking back into the data, we realized that this might be a problem for subtomogram averaging because this, as any other averaging technique, relies on the same conformation. And you can really see how flexible the spikes are, so how they bend. Uh, here and here, or sometimes they really look like they lie on the membrane. So what we decided to do, we tried to get sub part of the particles that actually is completely perpendicular to the membrane in the hope that they, in that way we could get the wall structure of the stock. So we did a classification uh, based on the distance from the membrane. And if you place the membrane here, we see that uh, we really got the, the spike and we really got the double leaf membrane uh, resolved here in this average showing that this is really class consisting of the particles mostly perpendicular to the membrane. However, we still didn't manage to get the lower part resolved. And we are a bit puzzled about that. And that's when we when we actually teamed up with the group uh, of molecular dynamics from Gerhard Hummer um, and my colleague Mateusz Sikora that actually did a lot of work and already back then they had the full model of the spike protein, uh, including the free hinges that they predicted. Um, and they denoted them hip, knee, and ankle. So that was already very good. And we wanted, obviously, to see if their models are consistent with our experimental data. So what they investigated before was the flexibility of the leg. So they always fixed one part of the spike and then let the other parts to move to see how what is the angular range of the movement? And when they plotted it uh, with the respect to the distance to the membrane, they actually obtained distribution uh, that is shown here. However, when we did the same calculations for our experimental data, we came up with this distribution that was uh, not very consistent. But then they looked into their models and found out that they actually placed the spikes very close to each other. So their movement was limited by, by the close proximity of other spikes. When they improved the model using our experimental uh, distances, they actually ended up with a very same distribution. And I, we found it very impressive that uh, there was such a high um, similarity of their models with our data. So with that, we decided to use their knowledge about the exact distances between the hinges. We double checked in our tomograms that again, it really fits. And again, the data is so good that you can, we, can, we could do it. We could see the hinges here and we could measure roughly. And the precise distance finally gave us the stock all the way down, but still the resolution, as you can see, is very low. It's 15, 16 angstroms. 
when we focus then more on the lower part and the used symmetry, we could also get the glycans uh, resolved a bit that fitted actually the model they had. But still, um, this resolution, at least for me, was a bit insufficient. So we try to push it harder by really split the stalk into the upper and lower leg and first focus on the upper part. And there we actually managed to get the right-handed polyp coil with the free helices nicely resolved around like 10 angstroms, but still the structure does not look as nice as I would hope. And again, I asked Mateusz for help on this and he tried to model this for me in, uh, model this for me. And basically the video shown here is, it shows how the cold pole is moving. So it's not so stable, it's a bit moving. And these movements are unfortunately uh, disturbing enough to prevent the real high resolution structure with the uh, number of particles we have. So uh, we, we are stuck at this 10 angstroms with this structure for now. And we moved a bit lower to try to get the lower leg because there is very little to known about the structure of this one. However, there we were not so successful. And again, when we look back into the data, we realized that uh, this fact is uh, complicated. The structure is, the obtaining of the structure is complicated not only by the flexibility, but also by the fact that it's unfolding. So in many cases, we found this uh, unfolding directly visible in the tomograms, which I uh, think is really amazing. But it's also clear that it really prevents the structure to be resolved unless we have way more particles at hand. And the last thing we actually did to combine the molecular dynamics with, the, with our data was we could directly fit the models they had into our tomograms. So we could uh, roughly estimate the angles from the, from the tomograms and pick the models that match, uh, match, the, clo clo match, close, match, the, match the angles at best. And right now, uh, I mean, in the future, we hope that we can actually use this to even improve the subtomogram averaging for the very uh, flexible parts. But for now, we really use it mostly to place the spikes back into our data. So we can now go for each virion and place the models back using, using the uh, simulations. And we can nicely render this. And really look at the virus in 3D as it corresponds to the experimental data we have. And I uh, think this is a really nice way because it gives us a better insights and better feeling of the distributions and of, uh, of how it actually looks. So as I said, we show that from the raw tomograms, we can nicely go through subtomogram averaging to decent structure, but we can also use molecular dynamics to even improve it. And we hope that in the future, this synergy will continue and we will use it to actually get even higher uh, high resolution structure, especially for the flexible uh, ones. And at the beginning, I said there is more than S, but I showed you only the S protein, but there is still M protein to be resolved and there is uh, still the nuclear, uh, nuclear capsid protein to be resolved. And anyone who is willing to try uh, that is welcome to do so. We, of course, put our data on NPR. Here's the code, so anyone can download, process, and try. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, Mateusz and Christoph, our supervisors, uh, supervisors Martin Beck, Gerhard Hummer, and Jakomine krenzel locker and of course, also Sonia Welsh for preparing the sample for CryoEP and Wim Hagen and uh, CryoEM service platform at EMBL for the, image, uh, the um, uh, amazing acquisition of the, of the great data set we had. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Beata. That was a nice, very concise, clear talk. Thank you. So um, there are already a few questions. Uh, so there's some technical question like, um, what grids did you use? A couple of people are asking that. Uh, yes, we, we, we had a normal carbon grids, but I'm uh, afraid that I will not be able to say, I think from Quantifoil, but I will not be able to say you the, the number of holes per, per uh, uh, this is all, all written in the publication code, but uh, that I am unfortunately not know. But there was nothing fancy about them. It was the car car carbon grids with from Quantifor, I think. Thank you. Um, okay, so then there's a question on the why is it are the spikes flexible? And uh, Jan Donalek is asking, um, is it known that if they were more rigid, uh, 
that would worsen that would weaken virulence i mean what what is the function of this yes mobility? so uh, so far this is still something to be investigated uh, because uh, we have a hypothesis but we we could not prove it. So the, we believe that uh, they are so flexible because then they can attach to the surface of the of the cell uh, with more more spikes. So they can actually they can actually uh, you know instead of one or two spikes that would be straight, they can actually really somehow hack the cell a bit better using more spikes. So this is our hypothesis. Um, as I said, it was not shown, uh, but we would like to uh, look into that a bit more. Um, and yes, if that is true, then obviously if they would be more uh, straight, if we, if we would, you know, can make them not be so flexible, then the assumption would be that they would be yes, uh, less infective because they would not have, they would have less chances to find the IC receptors for, for instance, or something like that. But this has to be still yet proven or investigated. So, I mean, is anything known about the density of the receptors on the cell surface? Uh, well, I'm not sure about that. I don't think so. Not to my knowledge, but it's possible that it's because I'm not a biologist, so I'm not so uh, not so um, top of of this uh, this information. If there was something new recently. Okay. Um, okay, we have a question now from Pascal Fender. Do you think the PFA fixation can affect the final structure of the variant? No. Um, so this is the standard uh, standard fixation that is not known to alter the structure of the of the things that it's used for. So shouldn't. <laughs> okay, then there's another question. You have shown the rendered 3D image of the virion. Is it common for spikes to be orientated mostly parallel to the ice-air interface? Uh, no. So we had we had many many variants where the distribution was more even. So even on the pole, so to speak, the spikes were there and were not uh, squashed because the the 3D model I'm showing here looks really a bit squeezed yeah. in one dimension, and also it looks like the spikes are a bit pushed, but we also had, uh, I think this is because it comes from a thinner tomogram, but we also had, uh, we also had uh, many variants that were more equally distributed and when the spikes were pointing uh, towards the um, viewer, let's say, so also, uh, you know, in the direction of that they were perpendicular. Okay, there's a, a comment from um, Karim Rafi. Hi, great talk. I was wondering if you believe it would be a viable option to recombinantly express the spike proteins, purify them in nano disks to help resolve the base and have a more complete model. I don't think so. We are now playing more with the option to actually, uh, you know, express the, the spike, uh, you know, as a virus like particle, to be able to play more with to see if we can actually make it rigid and things like that, that would help. I think uh, in the end we will just need a bit more data, a bit more particles to actually get some uh, some structure because some of its some of the base is unfolding. Uh, some of the uh, but there are still some that are stable. So there we should be able to actually get a structure if we had more particles. I'm not so experienced with nano disk, so I cannot answer this question uh, better than that. Okay. Uh, Sarah Butcher is asking how many spikes in each subtomogram average. So for the for the total uh, angstrom or five angstrom structure, we had around twenty six thousand spikes. So twenty six thousand for the eight eight angstrom without any symmetry, and with the imposed symmetry for the five angstrom structure. For the leg, there was very few. So for this complete straight leg, I showed as fifteen angstrom. That was, I think around 4,000 uh, spikes only that were straight uh, or or even less, 3,000 maybe. And for the leg, so the first old coil upper leg resolved at 10 angstroms that were again all mostly all data. So it was again around 20,000 particles, I think in that average. And again, without a symmetry. And then we also classify the head on for open and closed conformations, and then we find out that we have 8,000 fully closed conformations and around 4,000 with one open, uh, fully open RBD domain. 
Another question, why do you assume there is unfolding related to this? Is this related to the flexibility? Yes. And again, this is something that is very little known on the, on the stock. So this is something that we do not know what role actually it plays, for instance, from uh, when coming from pre-fusion to post-fusion state. And if this instability of the, of the stock is actually not something that should help this, this transition, but uh, this is still something that I think a lot of people are investigating. We are also looking into that, but we so far don't have any, any conclusions yet. Um, there's a question on whether the flexibility in the stalk somehow propagates up towards the more folded domain, inducing changes there. So we, we checked that, we checked if, if you know, the. For instance, the flexibility or the angles, if they do not influence somehow, whatever this is, for instance, open or closed, yeah. but we couldn't find any relationship on the data set we had. So any correlation that would be apparent or visible. There's a question from one uh, member of the audience wants to know why the virus service is not fully covered. We do not know exactly. Um, we believe uh, they, the spikes can really fuse in the membrane, so they can really move in the membrane based on how, it, how they need it. This is our, again, this hypothesis that uh, if the cell, if they are approaching the cell, they can, due to the flexibility and the fact that they can actually even like fuse in the membrane a bit and get, uh, get closer together, that they can have a better attachment to the cell. Now, um, the uneven, so, you know, I think they could be evenly distributed, but there's definitely not any pattern. But sometimes we saw also patches, not only, you know, sometimes people think that because we have the eyes at top and bottom that we don't, we get this bold parts on poles. But we also saw many, many variants where there was nothing on the sides, for instance. So really the spikes somehow decide how to occupy the, how to occupy the surface. And this is not really relevant to the, to the tomography based on what we saw so far, but we do not know how exactly it works. Okay, there's another question on whether the um, mutating the furin cleavage site affects the transition to the post-fusion state. Uh, yes, there was some research on this. As I said, I'm not a biologist, so I would very, not feel very comfortable answering those kind of questions. But I think there was a, there is a clear correlation between the presence of the cleavage site and the ability to open the RBD domain and just to go to the post-fusion state. But yeah, I, I do not unfortunately know more on this in the detail. One question you probably do know then is what software do you use for subtomogram averaging? So we had our own uh, software that is public, public, publicly available. It's called Nova STA, um, and uh, the links to it uh, to, to the download or to the GitHub where it's placed uh, can be found in the paper or under my name, I think, as well. This is just faster C++ version of the of the old Tom AV3 package that was developed years ago in Martin's Reef. Uh, there is nothing fancy about it. And then for the classification and for the nice structures in the end, we actually use StopCap that was developed by, uh, or is being developed by uh, William Bunn from Vanderbilt University. And this is now also publicly available on GitHub and uh, with the tutorial and everything. And I can highly recommend because it really delivers nice averages. So the next talk is from Dimitri Svergen. I don't think Dimitri needs any major introduction because you will know he is the sax person who has really done so much for developing technologies, methods, software in the field of small angle x-ray scattering and really showing how powerful it is when done rigorously. So Dimitri is going to give the next talk and it's on structural analysis of COVID-19 related molecules at EMBL Hamburg. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to give this talk. And uh, the, the title is the structural analysis of COVID molecules at EMBL Hamburg. But I shall start with the EMBL Hamburg because, uh, well, this is the first time I think uh, the site is represented at uh, the Instruct uh, seminar. And therefore, I shall first uh, say uh, what it is. So then we are here in Hamburg. Uh, so the main site of the MBL is at Heidelberg, it's somewhere to the south. 
And this is the place where Hamburg situates. Uh, so we had first the old storage ring, which was called Doris 3. Now we have the big Petra uh, 3 ring where synchrotron radiation services are provided to the community and essentially in, in biology. So this piece uh, harbors uh, 14 uh, beam lines uh, using synchrotron radiation, and Petra 3 is one of the brightest sources in the world. So, and then somewhere here, there are the three beam lines of the EMBL. And these three beam lines are one beam line in small angle scattering, two beam lines in uh, crystallography. And uh, we have also the uh, sample preparation and characterization facility for the users and also for the science. And we have people who are supporting it instrumentally and also for the user visits. So this is the site offered by Hamburg and which is now joining Instruct. So just a few words, uh, the SPC facility harbors the uh, high throughput uh, crystallization laboratory, biophysical platform, and also the data analysis platform where one can do uh, essentially everything one needs to characterize biological macromolecules, but by not X-ray methods. Uh, the small angle scattering uh, beam line, so which is shown here, uh, is highly automated, so we have uh, the automated sample changer and also it is highly brilliant with uh, all the optical elements and also has the biological user lab, uh, which is a kind of a principal difference uh, from other uh, sax beam lines in the world, which are mostly oriented towards general users, we are tailored towards the biological users. Just for those who do not know what small angle scattering is, you have an X-ray beam which is collimated, you have sample which is in solution, it is not crystal, so we have a scattering pattern on the detector and one dimensional scattering curve because particles are floating in solution, everything is isotropic, and from this one dimensional scattering curve we want to reconstruct three dimensional information about the particle, and this funny thing sometimes is possible. And there are the crystallography beam lines, which are available, so P13 and P14. One beam line is largely um, uh, tailored towards high throughput experiments and also low energy phasing. And P14 is a very versatile beam light with uh, high brilliance and also with a special hatch for the time resolved crystallographic experiments and also for the hollow tomography. So then this is kind of the general view of uh, the Hamburg outstation in terms of user services provision. And now I will say uh, something about the uh, how are we going during the times of COVID. So then this is how it looks like. So we are communicating to each other uh, with uh, the teleconference. So, so this is the picture, I think, in May uh, 2020, where there is one person uh, at the beam line and the rest is outside. And it is still like this. So we officially can have only one person at the beam line. So everything is pretty uh, empty. And these are the samples which are delivered to, to be measured. And of course, everything because of this COVID. And uh, I shall show a few examples of the projects that are done at the EMBL Hamburg to combat this uh, virus. First of all, in macromolecular crystallography, uh, the EMBL beam lines, P13 and P13, were taking part in a high throughput screening exercise on uh, repurposing drug libraries. So there was a available drug libraries with nearly 6,000 compounds, uh, which were tried to uh, find out um, the means uh, of combating the main protease of this SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, uh, because this is really a very potent uh, drug target. It is essential for the virus replication. And out of these many thousands of uh, experimental data collected, actually of the co-crystallization attempts, so there are two allosteric binding sites uh, found out, one is here and one is there. And uh, 37 compounds out of these many thousands were found to really binding to this M-PRO in the places where they can really uh, hinder its function. And of those 37, two attractive drug targets were found for drug development. So I think one is currently in some pre-testing phase. So this shows, of course, uh, the, well, 
drawbacks of uh, this approach whereby you test everything and at the end uh, out of thousands you get one but if you get one it is already actually sufficient and the STC facility was also contributing to uh, to this project and also to uh, five our other COVID related projects, uh, uh, for example, by the biophysical characterization. So this is going on uh, uh, actually as we speak now. So there are many projects running also at the STC facility. So then this is about non sax experience and uh, I will be mostly talking about what we are doing in sax and uh, in, in small angle scattering there was a very nice project uh, together with christian Löw, who initiated actually this project from EMBL hamburg and from cssb which is center for structural systems and biology situated near to, to the EMBL uh, beam lines and EMBL hamburg so then the idea well you you saw this spy protein beautiful pictures of the spy pro protein uh, in the um, uh, previous talk and actually this spike protein what it does it um, binds to to the cell membrane and initiates the fusion and uh, uh, one of the ways to stop it from doing this would be to block its um, binding to this ACA2 receptor on uh, the human side so to say so with something to, to block this receptor <clears throat> and to prevent the virus from entering the human cells and uh, the idea of christian was actually to use so-called side bodies which are parts of um, the immunoglobulins very small parts of in immunoglobulins uh, which can be active and uh, preventing and binding to to this uh, part of the spike protein actually this is this so-called receptor binding domain so they would bind there and prevent the um, uh, uh virus of entering the cell so there was a huge library of these uh, possible uh, side bodies candidates and uh, there was a small angle scattering study on it for screening so yes yeah, so this is actually what you see when you do small angle scattering experiment that are already in line everything is automated you just put the samples into the sample changer so the data is processed so these are the small angle scattering curves from different candidates and from these small angle scattering curves, you can uh, uh, see how well what is the radius of duration, what is the overall size, what is the maximum dimension, and also you can also see the, the shape of uh, the uh, the particle immediately. Actually, you get it something like a couple of minutes after the experiment is done. Uh, so then this uh, is what we see at the beam line, and then based on this, you can see well this is the table with the candidates, and from these candidates we we're looking for those which are largely monomeric and kind of have decent shapes such that they can be used for the analysis and uh, these are largely monomeric and this was kind of one of the best candidates it's cybody 23 was the uh, best candidate for the analysis uh, among the best candidates and this is the model of it which you can get just from the small angle scattering data so this is just one piece of the immunoglobulin and this is the tail which is added by the program such that it fits the experimental data so then this is selection stage so at this selection stage we can say okay this may be the best candidate and then one can try to have a complex of this best candidate with the uh, receptor binding domain which worked and uh, these are actually the three small angle scattering curves from the solution of the uh, side body from the solution of rpd on its own and from the solution of the complex so these are the three scattering curves and from these three scattering curves you can ab initial without knowing anything build a color model of the complex so then this model of the complex where the, the red is the nanobody and the blue is the receptor binding domain uh, fits all these scattering curves together and gives kind of an idea of where this side body is bound and actually this was a very good place for it to bound because it looked to be bound on the, the distant side of uh, the, the RBD and if you then uh, try to make a rigid body model actually this curve is fitted as a rigid body model of the side body plus RBD with adding the missing loops. It looked like the thing is really placed close to the ACA2 binding site, which is somewhere there. So then again, it was a very good candidate. And then there was a fantastic uh, cryo EM study of the entire um, uh, 
uh, are, uh, of the entire um, spike protein bound to this psi body, which was selected in part based on the SACS data, but also on the biological data. And here you can really see that it is bound uh, to the uh, to this part of uh, the, um, uh, the the spike protein and really there is a clash with the ACA2. So then this is a very good candidate in order to hinder the ACA2 uh, bind, binding of uh, the spike protein to the human cell. So then this is one of the projects where really the uh, several methods were employed to study the uh, biology well, the, uh, the possible candidate uh, for um, the prevention of the spike bound. But there were quite a few other projects at uh, our beam line where we used uh, uh, small angle scattering for other types of uh, proteins, which are related to um, the um, uh, to, to the, uh, the, the COVID virus. One study is the stoichiometry and organization of the so-called so uh, non-structural proteins. So these are non-structural proteins which play a very significant role in the regulation of the RNA uh, dependent RNA polymerase and therefore they are vital for uh, the replication of, of the virus. And uh, uh, the, the crystal structure of this protein was available. So this is the decamer. And actually, what we found with small angle scattering is that it is not decamer in solution, even at high concentration, it is a heterotetramer. And this heterotetramer fits very nicely with small angle scattering data and also actually the, the mass spectrometry data. This was mass spec plus the other biological methods, in particular small angle scattering, which was collaboration with um, uh, Charlotte Utrecht uh, from the Hans Petty Institute in Hamburg. And I'm just showing you the SACS part of the, the study, but there are also other uh, methods that were uh, employed. And actually, just the general message is the SACS is very good in combination with other techniques. And then as a final example, the collaboration with BioNTech. So probably you know BioNTech is a major producer of the vaccine. So that's we, 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 we are all looking for it, especially that AstraZeneca has apparently problems. So the BioNTech is uh, kind of the, the vaccine that would be very good. And they are using the SACS very actively in order to characterize the possible improvement of this uh, present vaccine. So then this vaccine is uh, the RNA, which is wrapped into the lipid uh, nanoparticles. And uh, one of the major advantages that they are now working on is to use the different wrapping mechanisms. So all these pieces that are wrapping the, uh, the mRNA can be used not uh, with, uh, I, I assume that they are using PEC at the moment, and this is uh, the scattering data from uh, the PEC prepared uh, nanoparticles. And these are the data uh, where you are using polysarcosine instead of it. And this uh, polysarcosine has quite a bit of advantages. For example, as you see from the maximum, the, the packing of the mRNA is much better. And then the, for the, pot the delivery of the mRNA may be more uh, potent uh, in, into the human cells. So then uh, this is one of the studies that we did with them. And then the other one was the characterization of Mm, the uh, lipoplex system, actually, it's again the nanoparticles, how the mRNA can be packed between the lipid systems. And then with small angle scattering, again, looking at the positions of the maxima, you can see what is the pH dependence of this characterization. And uh, just by changing the pH, this is one of the advantages of SACS. You can change whatever you want, temperature, you can change concentration, you can change pH and then look at the changes in the scattering patterns. And also, also you can see that uh, from, from eight, where the, the, the layers are kind of more or less randomly distributed, well, not randomly, but not regularly distributed, you can go to, to lower pH, whereby they are going to very ordered uh, distribution. And these can be used for the fine tuning of the uh, tailored delivery systems, especially given the fact that pH in our body is changing from, from organ to organ. 
So then these are the projects that we have uh, at uh, our line. We have actually more projects. I just selected these ones. But uh, these, uh, I think in this round, we had seven groups uh, which are working on these um, particles. I, I showed you only at the moment the, uh, the, the studies that were done last year. But we are also doing other things. So we are teaching people. So we have in small angle scattering, we had a course last year and we had the user meeting, everything of course virtual. Uh, and uh, also uh, in at EMBL, Hamburg at the moment, there is a work towards Tetra 4. So then this Tetra 3 ring is going to be refurbished into yet more brilliant ring, which is called Tetra 4. This is the future, just to say uh, just a word about it. And then finally, I would like to thank uh, the people involved in the studies, the Biosax, the mixed groups, SPC, and the uh, MPRO screening. So this was a project uh, together with CFL uh, of Thomas Schneider uh, and uh, Alchemans, uh, the Cybody project, as I said, that was collaboration with uh, EMBL and the Karolinska uh, Institute uh, and MSP. Uh, seven was collaboration with uh, Hans Peck Institute in Hamburg, and uh, the nanoparticles was with BioNTech and also my university. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Dimitri. It wasn't clear to me how you analyzed this data from the vaccine nanoparticles to, to really, so you could really say where the RNA was. Uh, while we are not saying where the RNA is, we are saying what is the structuralization of, of the RNA. So then uh, with this um, RNA uh, wrapping uh, into the, the lipid uh, layers, you can make models so you can uh, have the, uh, the uh, scattering data fitted by the different types of wrapping of the mRNA. And then you can at least say what is the probable way of packing of the mRNA into the uh, lipid carcasses. So, so. so there's one question from Simona Di Marco, which what is the mechanism of allosteric inhibition of mPro? So I, I I'm not really a biologist. Uh, so then this uh, I think it is working um, in. in well, the, the, the inhibition is simply the binding of, of the substances. So then the substances are, are bound to uh, close to the active center. So in, in, the, in, the page, in, in the picture I showed, those were the substances uh, which tend to bind close to the active center of the uh, MPRO. So I assume that if the, the, bound, the active center is blocked, then it is no longer active. Do you, do you happen to know whether they're covalent inhibitors or not? They're just, I presume, not. No, these are not. No, no, no. These are, well, these are just repurposed from whatever it is libraries yeah. that may somehow buy. Yeah. There's another question. Did you observe the presence of glycosylation? And was this affecting the recognition of the nanobody, the psi body, I guess? Uh, actually, we what we had, we had the spike protein, uh, which was glycosylated. So then the spike protein was kind of na naturally glycosylated. It was not stripped of glycans. So then, in principle, it works with the glycosylation. So the, all these models that I showed were with glycosylation. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. Thank you. Um, We'll now move on to the third and final talk of the program. This is by Hosan Marquez, my colleague here in Grenoble, who has um, who runs a very large and extensive and well-used crystallization facility. But um, what he's mainly concerned with nowadays is linking that directly through automation to uh, protein crystallography to as a tool for um, efficient drug development. So that's what he's going to talk about, online crystallography. Over to you, Jose. Hello, Stephen. Thank you. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. As Stephen has uh, said uh, before, EMBL uh, Grenoble is located in the European Photoneutron uh, Campus in Grenoble. And uh, we have a, a long-standing collaboration uh, with the ESRF. Together, ESRF and EMBL 
uh, develop and operate uh, six uh, crystallography beamlines and one uh, sax uh, beamlines. And these uh, beamlines receive thousands of, of uh, users uh, annually. Uh, uh, we also have a, both ESRF and EMBL have a close uh, collaboration with the ILL uh, and IBS uh, on the EPN campus as well. And together uh, we operate uh, cryos, uh, Titan cryos uh, beamline, uh, also available for access and uh, EMBL operates uh, the high throughput uh, crystallization uh, facility. Uh, I'm the head of this uh, facility and uh, we actually provide access to uh, crystallization uh, services, but we also have a strong focus on technology development. And today I will show how we have combined different technologies uh, to uh, uh, build and provide access to three uh, online crystallography pipelines that allow you to send protein and go all the way through crystallization and data collection, eventually structure solution through the web. One of these pipelines is dedicated to solve very rapidly and very efficiently new protein structures, what we call online crystallography. And the other two pipelines are dedicated to drug design. Uh, one is dedicated to fast small molecule characterization and the other one for large scale fragment screening, where you can screen about uh, 1,000 fragments or more. Uh, these pipelines are accessible through different uh, funded uh, projects, INEX Discovery, Instructs, and others. So if you are interested, just yes, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. One of the key technologies that uh, had to be developed uh, to support these uh, uh, pipelines was technology for automated crystal molding. Crystallization uh, and data collection is already automated for several years, but crystallization, the crystal, the process of crystal molding wasn't, and, and this was limiting the throughput and, in, and interrupting the pipeline. Uh, many groups had worked in this uh, area, uh, attempting different approaches from semi-automatic systems, optical tweezers, acoustic uh, systems, etc. Our team, together with uh, Florence Piani from the instrumentation team in EMBL Grenoble, uh, had a different idea. Uh, our concept was to grow uh, uh, crystal, crystals, set up crystallization experiments in very, uh, in very thin films, uh, as you see here, uh, and then use a laser system to cut the size, these films, these pieces of film containing the crystals that then are glued uh, to the tip of a data collection pin. It's quite a simple process, but it required quite a lot of uh, instrumentation development. Here you have a view of the instrument that was built by the instrumentation team uh, from Forensic Training and Algar Geli uh, Pap. This is the harvester itself, and it is connected to a sample changer that actually, once crystals are uh, harvested and uh, cryo cool, the system recovers the samples and stores them in uh, data collection packs, packs that can then be transferred to the beamlines. What are you? What you are going to see uh, next is the video of how this process uh, works. Here you have an interface, uh, web interface, where you can have uh, images of the uh, crystal experiments as they come from the crystal farms. And then through the web interface, you have controls that allow you to decide how your crystals are going to be harvested. You can select a series of sub shapes uh, that are compatible with your samples and locate them for the crystal harvesting process. You can harvest more than one uh, time from a single drop. And as you can see, you can harvest multiple crystals uh, in a single drop, which is difficult in a single pin, which is difficult to do by hand. All these instructions are recorded. And when we put the plate, the crystallization plate in the crystal harvester, uh, the harvester automatically recovers these instructions and then, uh, and then automatic harvesting uh, starts. Uh, first, the machine loads a pin, uh, then it moves to the uh, crystallization drop, makes a small aperture and uh, removes uh, the liquid crystallization liquid around the crystal, and this is to help cryo uh, cooling. And uh, then it applies a little bit of glue to the tip of the pin automatically, and then puts the pin in contact with the outside part of the film and uses the laser, as you will see here, to cut, excise the film containing the crystals uh, that is uh, transferred to the pin and then uh, cryo cool in a, a nitrogen gas uh, station. Then the, the uh, uh, C-axis robot takes that sample and transfers them to the uh, either spine or, or, or unipax uh, uh, where it will stay until uh, data collection. And uh, before that transfer is finished, you see that the next harvesting is already operating. So uh, this technology uh, has a number of advantages. Uh, I will not have to go in detail to all of them, but in addition to automating the process uh, completely, it, it tends to, pro to produce less mechanical stress to the crystals. So it tends to work, work better with, with fragile crystals. And uh, as I mentioned before, in many cases, 
uh, it is possible to cryocool crystals without adding cryoprotectants when, when by the normal process uh, you need to do it. And by now we have uh, actually processed many samples with this technology in the facility. The other important uh, technology that has been developed in the uh, last years and that was uh, important for this approach is the ESRF massive one beamline that uh, uh, was a project, uh, again, a collaboration between the ESRF and the EMBL. And uh, these beamlines allows you to do fully automated hands-off uh, data collection over hundreds of crystals. You can just load the crystals in the sample changer, press a button, and then walk away. The system will put uh, one crystal after the other into the beam. We'll use the X-ray beam to raster and find the positions of those crystals. And once they are identified, it will calculate an optimal data collection uh, strategy, collect the data, and then store it and then go back to the next crystals. So this is a great uh, facility in the context of the uh, uh, concept that we are discussing. So uh, we established a collaboration with the ESRF, the MX group, head by, uh, headed by Gordon Leonor, uh, the instrumentation and uh, diffraction uh, uh, teams in EMBL, led by Florence Ukraine and Andrew McCarthy, and uh, by our own uh, team uh, in EMBL. And uh, Irina Kormasia, staff scientist in my team, was driving force behind all this uh, project. And the goal was to combine the crystal direct technology and the massive technology to provide fully automated uh, protein to structure pipeline. And uh, one important aspect to develop before we could uh, do this was to implement uh, new software tools. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, developed a crystallographic information management system, CRIMS, which is a uh, a uh, result of an EMBL-wide collaboration involving Grenoble, Hamburg, and, and Heidelberg. And this software allows you to follow the samples from pure protein all the way through crystallization, crystal optimization, even crystal harvesting. Uh, this software uh, is now in use in several uh, crystallization facilities in Europe and also in pharma company. And uh, uh, we added to this software, uh, and, the, and we are receiving feedback from, from, for the design of uh, and development of this software from, the, from many users. We upgraded this system with a module that is able to communicate uh, CRIMS with a synchrotron and data collection uh, data management systems like ISPI-V so that we can send information about the crystals uh, we're sending and then recover information about uh, the data collections that have been uh, carried out. And uh, more recently in collaboration with uh, the group of uh, Gerard Bricogne, uh, Global Facing uh, Limited, uh, uh, we uh, developed together uh, automated pipelines for uh, uh, data processing, which are particularly helpful in the context of fragment screening. And I will talk a little bit about that later. Well, through the combination of uh, hardware technologies, but also software, we were able to uh, uh, provide access to these online crystallography uh, pipelines, and uh, which basically give you access to a high throughput crystallization facility and uh, automated data collection at the uh, synchrotrons uh, from your desktop. Basically, you just uh, ship this the sample to uh, uh, Grenoble, and through web uh, uh, interfaces, uh, you are able to design crystallization experiments from uh, your office. Uh, operators will carry out those experiments at the facility, and then when uh, uh, crystallization images from those experiments are available, you will receive them in real time. Based on these results, uh, you can uh, design uh, crystal optimization experiments if you have initial hits. And when crystals appear that are uh, ready for data collection, you can use the interface that I showed you before uh, to decide how these crystals are going to be harvested. Once they are harvested, uh, they will be cryocooled and transferred to the beamline at the next possible time. Uh, you have an utility increase that allows you to connect to your preferred synchrotrons. Um, we have a uh, connection to ESRF, of course, but also to Petra3 and SLS. You can enter your bag number and uh, give a series of parameters about how do you want your samples to be collected and then do either fully automated uh, or remote, uh, uh, remotely operated data collection. And once the data is collected, this can be repatriated. Uh, one of the special uh, uh, opportunities of combining the Crystal Direct technology and Massive One is that, as I showed you before, in, with Crystal Direct, we can mount several crystals in a single pin, and actually, uh, Massive can actually automatically detect all these crystals independently and do independent data collections uh, in a single pin, which is, uh, increases the efficiency uh, uh, very notably. These are a few examples of projects that we have supported over the time. There, there are many, but uh, well, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, for this particular project, uh, users from Austria were able to solve three different structures, three different conformations from the same proteins in a 
a record time thanks to the capacity to iterate very rapidly between crystallization and, and data collection. We are able to uh, provide uh, usable data with very difficult to handle crystals and, and, and many other examples. Uh, as I said before, these uh, facilities are very uh, helpful for the rapid characterization of uh, target small molecule complex complexes, for example, in the complex of in the context of medicinal chemistry optimization. And here you have an example. This was in this case a, a user from a pharmaceutical company that sends uh, uh, proteins and lead compounds uh, on day one. And then in just a few days, we were able to uh, set up the crystallization experiments, collect the crystals with the crystal har direct harvesting technology, do automated data collection at Massive, and then give, the, give them the data in just a few days. And uh, after a few, a few uh, weeks, uh, the chemists develop new compounds, they send the SAS, and then we can go through iterations and iterations uh, to finally develop highly potent tool compounds and drugs eventually. This uh, concept of online uh, crystallography uh, has a number of, of advantages. It removes uh, manual and repetitive operations, uh, saves you time and you can focus more time on data analysis and be more productive. And uh, also uh, provides very rapid, rapid throughput and you will see uh, this in the next applications I'm going to introduce. But another uh, of the advantages of this uh, approach is that it makes crystallography more accessible to those for whom uh, crystallographer is not the everyday uh, uh, tool. And here we have examples of uh, young scientists from uh, biochemistry labs, labs that did not have a focus on, on structural biology before, but that thanks to these technologies were able to produce very uh, insightful structures that led to high impact uh, publications. And this is because this approach removes many of the difficulties uh, associated to, with access or, or, or preventing uh, easy access to macromolecular crystallography. Another context in which uh, uh, crystallography uh, has become, well, has been always, but has uh, uh, become very important, even more important in the last times is in the uh, uh, drug design area. Uh, uh, this is not only concerning uh, uh, pharma industry, but also uh, recently uh, more academic labs are developing uh, an interest in developing chemical tools for research, but also to validate and establish proof of concept for the therapeutic potential of a certain target. And uh, this was a concept that was spearheaded by the Structural Genomic uh, Consortium. And now there are several facilities in the world that can do fragment screening and uh, like, for example, the XCHEM facility in Hamburg, eh, sorry, in Diamond. Uh, the Crystal Direct technology offers an opportunity to automate the process of uh, ligand salting, the process of delivering the small molecule to crystals. With the Crystal Direct technology, we can automatically deliver small uh, solutions containing small molecules to crystals through the aperture that I mentioned before. Here you see that after making the aperture, we can deliver a small drop of solution that then diffuses into the crystals. And if the molecules spawn, spawn in these solutions bind to the crystals, then we can harvest the crystals as, as uh, following the process that you have seen before. And then if the, if the, if the molecules are bound, you will see them here. This is an example of a, a validation uh, project that we run with uh, Magali Masi at Sanofi. We have integrated this process to provide uh, large-scale fragment screening, where we can uh, screen automatically fragments, uh, fragment libraries with more than 1,000 fragments. Uh, but for this, we had to improve our uh, uh, CRIM software to be able to cope with, uh, to help with data processing. And uh, basically, uh, we have now a module that is able to recover all the data uh, concerning a fragment screening project from the synchrotron. And then uh, we apply the global facing pipe dream uh, data processing pipeline to do automated data reduction facing and ligand hitting, ligand finding. Uh, 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 through CRIMS, you can automate, you can, uh, through a, a web interface, you can have access to the results from all these data processing jobs so that uh, in a, a very quick way, you can evaluate thousands of fragment screen experiments and very rapidly identify those that may contain uh, hits. Uh, this is an example of a fragment screening project that we supported uh, recently. This was a collaboration with a group of uh, Wolfgang uh, Janke from uh, Novartis uh, Research Institutes in Basel. And in this case, we were able to uh, identify a series of fragments binding to different binding sites in the uh, surface of uh, an essential uh, enzyme from Trypanosoma brucei. And each of these uh, fragment, it's in fragment binding sites, produce, provides new opportunities uh, for the development of uh, inhibitors against this protein and hence uh, inhibitors that could serve uh, for uh, or have potential as antiparasitic uh, uh, for antiparasitic uh, thera uh, therapies. This is just one example. We have supported many 
component fragment screen projects of, of this kind. I, I don't have the time to go into the detail, but this is one of the uh, access uh, uh, opportunities that we provide through uh, INEX Discovery. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, the high throughput uh, approaches is not just to be able to, uh, to support many projects, but also to uh, have a lot of data to improve, uh, uh, to improve uh, uh, protocols and develop new uh, approaches. And uh, in this case, in collaboration with the Global Facing Group, and uh, uh, they were, uh, we basically gave them access to uh, uh, data from uh, our fragment screening projects. And based on this, they were able to develop new data collection protocols, but also automated refining protocols that maximize uh, heat detection during fragment screenings, which is, which is a very important aspect to make the process uh, more efficient. These resources are not only helpful for that, but they are also very uh, helpful for uh, uh, supporting research uh, uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, 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 to COVID-19, uh, And here you have uh, two examples of projects that have been supported at the Massive One uh, beam line. Uh, the first one uh, concerns uh, part of the uh, RNA capping machinery for some, from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, encoded by the NSP10 uh, protein. This uh, 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 function is essential for uh, viral, viral replication. And in this case, the group of uh, Frank Kosielski from UCL in London uh, were able to carry out a large scale fragment screening uh, 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 project on this protein and identified several hits, which now they are uh, analyzing and, and, and exploiting to develop inhibitors against this uh, protein. Uh, the other example is from a company, a biotech company called Maxion. They have uh, made a publication recently on this project and uh, basically they screened, they isolated antibodies from COVID-19 uh, uh, patients, uh, two of which were very uh, potent against uh, SARS-CoV-2 and have a strong potential as uh, uh, therapeutic antibodies. And uh, the structure of one of these antibodies in complex with uh, the spike protein allowed to uh, underpin, uh, uncover the molecular mechanism, uh, uh, giving details on how this antibody actually binds to the uh, receptor binding uh, surface on the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. So these are just uh, two, uh, two examples of uh, SARS-CoV-2 related research. Uh, I would like to finish just uh, highlighting again that uh, these uh, online crystallography pipelines uh, put into structure fast convo characterization and large scale fragment screening are available uh, to you either through INEX Discovery Instruct programs and also through uh, the Frisbee, which is the French version of Instruct. And uh, yeah, if you are interested, just uh, contact us. Uh, for those of you uh, from industry that might be interested to use these uh, uh, resources, uh, you can also contact Alpex, which is a spin-off that has been recently created to provide uh, crystallography services to the pharma and biotech sector based on the crystal direct technology. So if you're interested, this is also accessible to you. Uh, finally, I would like to say that, well, in the future, we're going to go uh, deeper and further into this uh, concept. And one uh, big project that results from the continued cooperation between EMBL and, and ESRF is the massive uh, one beamline upgrade that in addition to having uh, after the ABS uh, ESRF upgrade, having much more uh, much more brilliant and, and, uh, and powerful beam uh, will also come with the integration of a crystal direct harvester at the beam line that will enable to not only increase the efficiency, but develop uh, new applications that we could not do before. And uh, finally, just to very quickly mention that recently in collaboration with the group of uh, Sebastian Grenier in uh, Montpellier, uh, we have been able to develop methods based on the crystal direct technology that allow very rapid analysis of uh, membrane proteins, uh, crystals growing in LCP, uh, also combining serial crystallography analysis. So if you're interested, please uh, contact us. I would like to uh, finalize by uh, thanking uh, all the people who contributed, the STX Lab members that you see here, and particularly Irina Kornasiu, who was a major driving force between uh, behind this uh, uh, project, and that now is the uh, CEO of Alpex, the company I mentioned before and also the Alpex team that also actually has contributed and continues to contribute to the, with the MBL to the development of, of these uh, approaches. Also, of course, the diffraction instrument station team led by Foran Cipriani and now by uh, Gergeli Pap and uh, the members are really, we have a very close interaction with them as you can imagine. Also the synchro, the EMBL synchrotron uh, diffraction team and the ESRF MX uh, group and the collaborators that you see here. 
I would also like to thank the uh, funding agencies which you, um, uh, you understand. So with that, I would like to uh, finish and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I would be happy to answer your questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hosan. Um, there was one question indeed about uh, LCPs, which I guess you've answered with one of the last slides. Maybe you can just add a bit more. Yeah, harvest, harvesting crystals in general is, uh, is challenging, as you know, but uh, harvin, harvesting crystals grown in LCP, it's uh, even harder because the LCP matrix can sometimes be very viscous and it can be really difficult. So what we have done is a new method to be able to grow, to, to, to set up LCP experiments, crystallization experiments on crystal direct plates on these very thin films. And with this, we can uh, use the automated, the laser-based crystal harvesting to harvest the samples, and then either do single crystal crystallography or more often serial data collection crystallography because very often uh, LCP crystals uh, tend to be microcrystals. So basically we can solve, I don't know that I have another slide here, in this recent work from uh, uh, in collaboration with Sebastian Grenier, also Sibon Basu, we have been able to solve uh, several protein structures of uh, membrane proteins uh, at room temperature, but also at, um, in, under cryocooling conditions in a very efficient way. And this is something that is uh, the, man, the manuscript is in preparation. So if, if you have an interest in this, please don't hesitate to, to contact me for more detail. And of course, we hope that this will become uh, at some point a, a new service in the facility. Very important to say that this was done in cooperation with Frisbee, which is the French branch of uh, Instruct. Thank you. Um, there was another question: Is is that does the harvester work with ninety six well drop crystallization plates? Well, the harvester requires the crystal direct plate, which is a ninety six well crystallization plate, uh, and the requirement is because we need this very thin film that can be cut with the laser. So actually you need to have the crystals in, in crystal direct plates. The crystal direct plates are available from Mitogen, so you can purchase them and they are similar to all, all the crystallization plates. And it should be very easy to transfer from your preferred plate to the crystallization plates. Otherwise you can just send the proteins to the facility here in Grenoble through the different access process. And then we can basically do the, the, the crystallization experiments for you directly on crystal direct plates. Um. Question on what are your suggestions regarding protein RNA crystals? <laughs> well, <laughs> we have a number of those and probably Stephen can, can uh, talk about this. I mean, uh, one of the, uh, among many others, one of the things that we have supported is uh, that from Stephen, but also many others. And, and I think for us, it's, uh, it's uh, just another sample. You have to, to maybe be careful in case of RNA, to be careful if your RNAs are prone to degradation. So we have to, uh, be in touch to, we very often people contact because their samples have very specific requirements. So uh, yes, don't hesitate. Although you can you can uh, control the whole process through the internet, it is important at some point to, to discuss with us if you have special requirements and we can adapt, adapt to them. Okay, well, thank you very much again, Hosan, and indeed all the three speakers, Hosan, Dimitri and Beata. I think it was a a really good session. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And don't forget the next webinar in Finland from Finland Center, April the 13th. Yeah.